about uh, a month ago, I received this email from a friend called Johan. Johan's like, um, and in this case, a young young man. Uh, he came to Embukum. He'd been to Schumacher College. He'd done all kinds of stuff, and he is in part Greek. And uh, with Greece going through what it's going through, at a certain point he felt, having inspired to do something in our world, perhaps I should go back to this country to which I'm so closely linked and, and see what's happening there and see what I can do. And this is a part of the email I received. 100 forest fires destroying huge tracts of what little is left of Greece's depleted ancient forests. An illegal invasion of Greek waters by large internationally owned industrial fishing trawlers who've caught on to the fact that our Coast Guard are starved of money to buy fuel for their patrol boats. Severely ill patients in hospitals denied treatment because pharmaceutical companies have ceased providing medical supplies due to massive unpaid bills owed by the state. Near daily, mob lynchings of immigrants by neo-Nazi Golden Dawn goons in Athens and absolutely no effort by the police to stop it. Reportedly, 60% of the police force signed up members of Golden Dawn. On top of all of this, on the eve of the election, there was an attack with hand grenades on the offices of a liberal daily paper while elsewhere in Athens, a police station was torched with petrol bombs. We have a sense, I feel, and it's, I don't, I understand completely why we should feel like this, but for many of us at least, and what I've just described is so far away. We look out here in these beautiful grounds and the trees and the mown grass, and it's wonderful, civilized kind of society that we have, this sense of sort of peacefulness and we listen to each other, we do all sorts of extraordinary things like that. We, that, that this world that I've just read about is so far away and yet that's, that's Greece. Same place that so many of us were and many still are piling off for our holidays and now Spain is also beginning just creaking at the edges and we have a sense, I think, perhaps more in the last 12, 18 months than we've ever had, that perhaps something similar could even happen here. And at Embukum we're asking ourselves all the time this question because who is it that comes to Embukum? Who is it that comes here to this gathering? And actually I pray daily really that we do not have coming to Embukum people of like minds and we do not have people coming in a sense to retreat or to somehow do that but people who are coming dedicated and inspired to take action to do something and it is not in a sense a criticism of, of maybe Embukum and our gathering here that we should have a slice of our society that is so narrow. But it is the fact that there are millions and millions and millions of people in our own country completely untouched by these issues that we are taking the time in these last few days to discuss and explore. What is it that would take, what would it take to bring a people to their feet? to bring a whole nation to its feet, or enough of that nation to really impact this world? And I find myself, I struggle with that question. I feel as if I know one answer, but that's not the answer we're looking for. Extreme catastrophe seems to work, but not catastrophe the other side of the world, or even in Greece, but right here, so that we can smell it and feel it and touch it and taste it. And then perhaps we step forward. But even of those of us, like me, you, many others, 
who are attentive to what is happening in our world and feel that we step forward because we engage in these conversations, of those people, how many of us are really applying our intelligence, our gifts, our energy to what needs to be done? In the conversations at Empicum, we've come to the conclusion that the most, the gravest danger that faces us at this time is the passivity of ordinary good people. We stand on the sidelines, we maybe engage a bit, we separate our rubbish, we buy a little differently. We do a few of these odd things, but do we really bring ourselves forward? I know, and I certainly question myself on that front, and I guess many others do as well. And even though at this time, you know, everything to do with community, we understand is that we need to come back together in community to find each other as, again, to come together. The power of one individual who decides that they are going to bring themselves and step forward is enormous. And I wanted to bring a few examples of that. And I wanted to bring them from places that we perhaps tend not to think of so often. So I'll start with someone within Procter & Gamble right now. Her name is Virginie, and she went on WWF's One Planet Leaders program in Lausanne. And that program has been created by WWF within their sort of the education part of corporate relations to try to resource and help those people in organizations, large organizations, who are struggling to make a difference in their businesses. And this one particular woman, who has all her life had very strong uh, beliefs, uh, religious beliefs, but also a very strong dedication to social causes, but has not had any sense or any relationship with environmental uh, challenges that we face, went on that program, One Planet Leaders. And somehow or other, because she was ready and also perhaps of what she heard and saw and met and, heard and, and considered, felt touched. Not 100%, just another 5% or 10% or something like that. And she then came to Embercombe and she went on the Journey Programme. And the Journey Programme is quite a deep dive, really. And she burst into tears in the first session and she didn't really finish until five days later when she left the place. And she got touched and she felt another 10 or 15%. And I'm so grateful, you know, that she did not go back to Procter & Gamble and hand in her notice. She stayed in that giant juggernaut of a business twice the size of Unilever. She stayed in there and she began to really pitch hard. She is an extremely powerful individual. She is a marketing director within P&G and highly thought of. But she has tremendous energy. She's also very bright and she's educated and she is nothing if not courageous. She engaged conversations and she lobbied. And now, only a few months later, she is Global Sustainability Director for Procter & Gamble. And she's starting a firestorm inside that organization. If this had happened perhaps 12 months ago, two years ago, would she have been successful? Maybe not. Because there is no doubt about it that with Unilever having made the moves it's made, it has put rocked P&G onto the back foot and they're smarting a bit and they're anxious and they're nervous and so I'm sure that helped a lot. But the inertia within organisations like that is huge. But now all kinds of things are beginning to happen in that business. And this is a little story I give you of something that happened just that two months back when Virginie began really bringing this forward. We met in Geneva with one of the te leading teams in Europe who are m very highly thought of within the P&G um, business. A high performing team producing extraordinary results. We chose this team because this team, if they took this, this thing with sustainability, if they took it, then others would notice. It had to be a high-performing team. 
And I arrived and there were various consultants there and they were giving presentations on what's happening in the world environmentally, what's happening socially, and then all kinds of other case studies showing what other businesses are doing at the moment with Danone, with Unilever, with a whole host of others. And we were about halfway through that meeting and I looked at our audience. You know, this was the senior management team of this group and I looked at them and I heard them in the coffee break and I knew we were losing this battle. And several of them all said sustainability was sick to death of the word, let alone whatever it means. We're so tired of this thing. He said, listen, let's, get, let's have a conversation. Let's understand each other. We are measured month by month on our results. And, that, and, 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 the, and the pressure on us is so huge and so intense that we take our attention off that to even the slightest degree and then we come under the cosh. And you may say that our mortgages and all the rest of it are not important, but they are important to us. Sustainability, they said, we haven't got time for it. And we were, we were sat, on, we were on the back foot now, thinking, how do we describe what this thing is? So, took a risk. We said, listen, we would like you to form a circle, and I'm, I'm going to ask you a question. And when you hear that question, maybe, maybe you, you'll, you'll, you know, you'll, you'll immediately feel switched off and you'll want to leave. I'm saying to you, before you hear the question, commit that you will engage in this process. And if at the end of it you think it was tedious and, and irrelevant, then you can tell me afterwards and we'll work something out. Sit in this circle and I will ask you this question. I ask each one to answer to the deepest, most truthful way that you can. And that question is, what do you most love? So our team immediately there was a certain kind of, oh my God, and they made their circle. What do you most love? But they engaged with it. They really engaged with it. And we had tears in that circle. And the overwhelming answer from almost every single one, of course, was my children, my family, my friends certain special places in nature. The list is really quite small because it is the same for all people, really, when we begin to discuss those things. And as we went round that circle, people started talking for longer and longer, each person, because they could feel the trust and the sense that this was a space in which they could do this and it was okay. Until by the time we got round to the last third of that circle, people were really going deep with this. And when they completed, I said, well, you see what you've just described. That is sustainability. It is all about our children, about community, about all the things that we most love and treasure. And for some of that is more to do with people and some more to do with nature. For some that's more to do with all different, we have our differences. But in the end, that is sustainability. So I'm going to ask you why, if those are the things that you most deeply and profoundly love, would you not align your professional work to those same things in order that you could say that at the end of your professional life that you have brought all your gifts towards the things that mattered to you in your life and have that satisfaction and have that pride. And I was amazing to see how this group of people responded. All the negativity, all the cynicism, all of the rest of it was dissolved and gone. The finance director confessed to the fact that he meditates and is into yoga. Okay. One after another, they began talking about things. One of them admitted that they had participated in some certain campaigns, and all the thing began to bubble up. But what really turned them on was, because these are, there's no doubt about it, they will always be the same, I think. They love the business of business. They love it. They may complain about being under the cosh by the month, but actually they love that world. So to try to persuade them somehow to leave it, and even, even I don't think that's necessarily a good idea, the f but the thing that they loved was the thought that this organisation, many of whom have been with for years, might 
we might turn that huge ship and that they might one day, and I have to admit, yes, we're an awful long way from this being anywhere near true, but to imagine that their enormous business could make a huge positive contribution. So we ask the question, what if, I mean, P&G produce all these detergents amongst many other things. Every day, millions and millions of washing machines empty the contents of that of that into our waterways and that that pours out into the rivers is toxic is not is not uh, neutral what would it take we said to produce a wash from our washing machines that would mean that when the water comes out and goes into the rest of the environment that it was entirely neutral and had no negative impact. And the guy who is the main chemist in that group just put his head in his hands. And everybody said, well, why, why, why the head in the hands? He said, because the truth is we could do it. And yet, my God, when I think about the work, when I think about what the, the sleepless nights, you know, the intensity, and yet at the same time within that room, because they loved the business of business, there was a frisson of excitement of a real adventure that they could engage on. So I want to swip, switch and just mention a little about PepsiCo now. PepsiCo holds a strapline, products with purpose. It's a bit odd, really. And one that causes acute embarrassment to the employees of PepsiCo, at least the ones I met. We gathered in Barcelona with a group of the guys who, who are the buyers buying huge quantities of potatoes, oranges, all kinds of other, other uh, I mean, food products from agriculture that go towards the products they make. And the point of this workshop was to explore whether the buyers were willing to accept more different criteria into the two that they primarily have, which is cost and reliability of delivery. And we had an extraordinary two days. You know, what I'm trying, what I'm, I hope that I'm indicating here, you see, is that we have our practical action. And, and goodness knows we all know that that's really important. But what is the road, what is the pathway that unlocks somebody to begin to bring their gifts and their skills in a different way? And I, and I do not think it's debate. I have never yet heard a debate in which somebody on the other side of the data has put up their hand and said, yeah, actually, yes, I, I really see what you're saying. I agree with you. You've won. Yeah. I've never heard that. I've never heard um, even uh, an argument which has resulted hardly ever have I heard an argument in which somebody says, actually, yes. Conversation. Some way in which we really feel anybody, whoever they are, feels deeply listened to a way in which we're not pushing what we think to be right, but we're engaging in an exchange. There's a softness to that. What really opened up those PNG people was that they did not feel challenged, they did not feel attacked, they did not feel judged. We just opened up a space where their humanity would be allowed in some way to come forward. I feel this is what happened with PepsiCo in Barcelona. We just opened a space. And as a result, we have got criteria now and we've got some really exciting things which means that those people are connecting to the human impact of the decisions they make in the way that they buy their food. Now, does this mean that in the end, actually, because it's still scratching the surface and I don't want to run away from that fact, do we want PepsiCo's, do we want P&G's and the way they're constituted and the work they do? I'm not sure that we do, really. Why should we have any kind of business that is something other than social enterprise I can't imagine why we would. But at the same time, to, change, to, to influence and change what we have, the ability to change and influence towards a further goal feels like a good idea. And what, if I just take PepsiCo again, that whole workshop happened because one person who does care, who works within that huge organisation, is battling to, is, 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 would, would be absolutely at home here 
but he's staying within PepsiCo because he feels that that's a place that he might be able to make the difference. The thing that seems to separate between those of us who are actually stepping most deeply into that place and really risking stuff is a choice. And that's where we've got to in our leadership development work. After so many books on leadership, so many lectures on leadership, so, you know, a master's and something in leadership and all the rest of it, I have come completely to the conclusion that leadership is nothing more than a choice that we make. And by the way, when I talk about leadership, I'm not talking about this kind of leadership that we traditionally think about. I am simply talking about someone who's brave enough to act on what they know to be true because that's as good a definition of being a leader as I can think of. Someone who's brave enough to act on what they know to be true. And why is that so impactful? Because it's quite rare. And when you bump up in someone who is really delivering on that, who is acting in accordance with what they feel, know, feel and know to be true, we, we feel because we're seeing this thing embodied and it has real impact. It's a choice. It has nothing to do with our social background, our financial capability or anything else. It simply arrives the moment that somebody usually, when, actually it does often happen I think when we hurt enough to discover that we care enough and you make that choice. And we step forward. And we all of us, I'm sure many of you here know Polly Higgins. And tomorrow I'm in London with uh, a number of others with Polly Higgins as she's trying to give us the information that allows us to speak about it more powerfully. It's an example. It's just a woman, she cares enough to make life difficult for herself. And if you've ever met Polly, of course, you will see the joy that that brings embodied in that person. There are countless other people, and this is the extraordinary thing, it seems to me. At the moment when we do make that choice and we place ourselves there and we say with all my intelligence, with everything that I've been given, including the wounds that I've collected over a lifetime and all the learning that that brings me, when I step into that place and bring myself fully and wholly to that place, I sentence myself to a deeply happy, satisfying and fulfilling life. Because that is the outcome of that. There is a joy that is most deeply felt and expressed for people when they make that step. A deep joy. And if you meet Polly, then you will feel it, I'm sure. And she is not the only one, of course, there are countless hundreds thousands, millions of others. But it is in this what we call, when I talk about the passivity of ordinary people, the greatest danger we face is the passivity of ordinary good people. And that is where we need this leadership to take place. So I give one more example. I'm very fond of this guy, his name's Phil. Phil. Phil was raised in Exmouth, he's mixed race, he's built like a tank, he's a very tough man. He's been beaten up I don't know how many times because of his colour and being raised in a part of Britain where there are very few people with, uh, uh, other than white. And somehow or other he received all those experiences and it didn't break him. It pro provided within him a, a deep desire to make a difference in this world and he has so together with him we've created the Embercoon Building Company and young men who are on their, either on their way to or on their way back or out of prison are the carpenters, the plumbers and the electricians being, being worked there and some of these young men you would not wish to meet on a Saturday evening a few, at least a few months ago, because they do carry knives and they look forward to using them. They're a dangerous people. And why are they dangerous? Well, one of them, I can say, was raised within a deeply racist family all his life. His whole body, his mind, everything in him has been filled with hate since he was tiny. It's not that surprising. 
When he came to Embercombe, he didn't speak for virtually the first eight weeks. And then something happened somewhere and he said a few words. Another month later, he smiled for the first time any of us had ever seen him smile. And now he's apprenticed into that business and suddenly you begin to see who that person might be when a ring of people who care come round him and he can begin to entertain the possibility that the world was misdefined, was not defined correctly to him and actually it is different. And that there are possibilities to feel loved and to belong. He does not need challenging. He does not need confronting in that way. He needs to trust that this is a safe place and that he is welcome. So there's another question I have to myself and to you. How do we welcome in all those who are excluded and feel they have no part to play in this transformation that we are seeking? Three questions. And I bring to pretty much all the people I work with, we bring to people in Embercombe. And they sound simple. And the first one you've already heard. What do you love? The second question. What are my gifts? It seems surprising, but many people have real difficulty in answering this second question. Actually, many of the first real difficulty in answering the second question, what are my gifts? Because so many people walk around feeling pretty bad about themselves. They're either too tall or too short. They're either too hairy or not hairy enough. They're too bright or not bright enough. They're too wealthy or they're too poor to make a difference in the world. Soaked through with a feeling of not feeling very good about themselves is not a place from which we can powerfully engage this world towards the one that we long for. That second question, what are my gifts? The third question, what are my responsibilities? It's the least favourite question. What are my responsibilities? Not what are my responsibilities to the business I work for or indeed to my family, but right through deep within me, what are my deepest responsibilities? And when those three are aligned, what I love what my gifts are, my understanding and deep acceptance of the responsibilities I carry, and they are aligned again and brought forward into action, we have a truly powerful capability to make change. So I finish now just a few words about one other thing. There are countless people coming to Embercombe who within a very short space of time begin to talk, and places like Embercombe, Embercombe's just one of thousands actually, and, and many that are developing, who bring forward questions which we can only describe as being spiritual questions. Yet they don't wish, many of them, to locate themselves with any, anything that has so far been offered in terms of the religions. I know some do, and that is wonderful, but many, many, many huge numbers don't. There is something that I feel we need to find and fumble and sense our way towards, but it looks something like this. When I had both the challenge and the extreme challenge and good fortune to work with the Native American people that I worked with, they asked me one day, they said, Mac, you've heard of Gautama Buddha? I said, yes. They said, Amazing, wonderful, wonderful man, what, what he did. We understand that he sat under the Bodhi tree for a very long time and then he received enlightenment. What we don't understand, these are indigenous people, what we don't understand is why does everybody talk about Gautama Buddha but nobody ever mentions the tree? We think the tree had some part to play in this. Tell us, when Muhammad sat in his cave, in his dreaming kiva, and creation spoke to him, 
Why does everybody talk about Muhammad and nobody ever talks about the cave? When Moses went up the mountain and he comes back with them, everybody talks about Moses, nobody talks about the mountain. When Jesus went into the desert, everyone talks about Jesus. He said, what is this? With determination. And we somehow think that creation is only as big as human beings and that somehow it must be the human being. The trees, the rivers, the mountains, our gardens, all places of beauty. Creation expressing itself. I said, and you know what? You do not need to believe in these things. And yet they impact us spiritually hugely if we allow them to. Come outside, come outside. Stand in front of this valley with these mountains ranging there far before you. Mac, what do you see? Playing for time, I say mountains, rivers, trees. <laughs> They say, what you are witnessing is creation. If you were to open your heart big enough to allow this to enter, you would be on your knees weeping. And you know what? You can go and dive in that river and swim. You can invite that woman man to a kiss. You can climb that tree. You can smell that herb. You do not have to believe in it. It is as real as you are real. And if you let her, she will touch you. You do not have to believe anything. Just open yourself to the experience. And so we have made the garden and nature and the trees the centre and core of Embuku without a belief system attached around it except that it is so deeply moving to have the privilege of being alive at this time. Holding the gift that human beings were given that is different from my cat, which is the gift of choice. Smudge, my cat, can only be a cat. But we have this choice. And the choice is whether, whether or not you like the word to be a leader or not to be a leader. And if we choose to be a leader, someone who is brave enough to act on what they know to be true, then of course we are more than willing to follow in any way, providing that it resonates and aligns with what we know to be true. It does not mean that we suddenly go around issuing orders and being bossy. It means we just come to a very peaceful place inside ourselves where, from which we act. And the resonance of that, and the waves of that, and the impact of that can be enormous. So thank you very much. I'll finish there. Thank you, Mac. Um, we definitely have time for some, a few questions, but I, I, I just wanted to ask you whether it would be worth, particularly with this audience, mentioning the Catalyst program. Presumably it's ongoing, is it? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, Catalyst, uh, we, have, we have at the moment two core programs that we're running. One is the journey, the other is Catalyst. Uh, they are, in, in effect, the same, they have the same aims, same intentions, and some of the same content. And that is very closely aligned to Emkun's mission. Emkun's mission is to touch hearts, stimulate minds, and inspire committed action for a truly sustainable world. So that program catalyst for 18 to 25 year olds, who at the beginning of, of, of a, if you like, their, their professional life in whatever that might happen to be of their life, and with choices to make about which way to go, those questions that I mentioned are asked, what do I love, what are my gifts, what are my responsibilities, how can we come together in community with other people of some similar age, since at that age often there is a desire to come together, to be together, and then take action. So that's what Catalyst is, and there is, I think, some Catalyst workshops going on here, and there are some people here at the festival who are part of that team. The journey is 
Uh, for those of us who are no longer in that 18 to 25, though some people at age reach come on the journey. And because we've lived longer and have perhaps been, been, been through a few more bushfires and all the rest of it, it tend to be rather more tears and le less laughter, whereas in Catalyst is more laughter, less tears. One, of the cat one person who'd done Catalyst came on the journey and in the middle of it said, God, what is it with you people? You, know? <laughs> you, seem, you seem to have had really fucking awful lives. You know? <laughs> Truth is, one guy arrived in the first circle of the journey and we invite them to bring themselves forward. He says, I'm here because the rope broke. The rope broke last week. He sat next to the marketing director in P&G, who sat next to a person who's now in his 50s and has never worked, ever. Sat next to someone who got profoundly ill a while ago and may not have very much long to live. Sat next to someone who's perfectly ordinary and has had a happy life. The whole world comes, really. Catalyst and Journey, if you want a deep dive, depending on your age range, there are two things that we offer. And there is a price tag to it, but nobody has yet ever been refused a place in either program because they couldn't afford it. Thanks. I'm 21, so I'd love to come. Thank you. <laughs> but actually, I mentioned it because my, my stepdaughter went on Catalyst uh, when she was 20, and now three years later, she's starting a leadership program in Somerset. So it's just an extraordinary program. Anyways, questions, responses? What would people like to say? I might be a bit uninformed because I've been listening and trying to formulate lots of responses into current sentences and sometimes <laughs> it's a bit hard to structure the question well but um, what you just said leads really nicely onto what I'm thinking about so if, it, if we're being encouraged and supported to find our inner calling and our truth and ultimately be able to measure that based on our intrinsic values and having a clear definition and possession of those I'm wondering in, in kind of more corporate environments, I guess, as well as um, development and reflection, personal processes and spaces, how do, what tools are available to think about how we encourage that deep self-reflection, what do you love in a circle, for example, at P&G, and then how do you translate that into a really visible process where people can come together with their shared values to build a, a movement, a united direction of structural change, because it's really great having that self-clarity, but how do we translate it into a, an alternative model of, of a working civilization group? Yeah, well, I, I'm not sure, I don't know sure that there is any, of course, one answer to that. But, you know, I could name another one, the guy Charles Anderson, say, sovereign insurance in um, New Zealand. Um, he just decided that to try and find a way to, to, to bring a, a community together in this. So he's begun together with some to looking at the, sustain, the Association of Sustainable Insurers. And now that's beginning to wrap in. And sooner or later, all insurance companies, I think, will want to belong to that. Um, within different organisations, of course, there are also all kinds of different, uh, where the, when the organisation has reached a certain stage in its evolution, where it will begin to build things into the business that support that process. At the moment, um, it is absolutely true that for many people coming from those organisations, they come, they glimpse something, and when they go back in, they're in a, in a, in a, in a place and, and an environment that is hostile to the continuing and deepening of that process. But that's where you know, this, to me, anyway, is in, in a lot to do with ordinary life because I think probably a lot of us have something similar. We will be in relationships, for instance, that do not help sustain and support us in the beliefs and values that we have, and yet so many times we stay in them. We'll have friendships, and those friendships often we, we hold on to them because perhaps we don't have other friendships, and, and they feel, it feels we don't want to let go of them. We have families which criticise us and all the rest of it, not all of them support and endorse and encourage us, and so on and so forth. We are called, this is part of that choice. The, the, the lovely, the great thing is, when asked once myself, what do you call failure, by one of those people that I was talking about, as Native American people, and I was at the time lying on the floor in a most dreadful state, 
These guys are standing above me called asking me what do I call failure. And I can't remember, between sobs I said something. And he said, not getting up again. He said, failure is never sort of the inability to achieve a goal that you've set and everything. It's whether having, having found yourself incapable of meeting that goal, you get up again. So I think to begin with, we focus there. I will get up again. I will sustain. I will not step away from this. And then we look in our own individual circumstances all the time for communities that we can locate ourselves with. I'm not talking about literal communities always. In social media, any kind of community that will come together and that will sustain you. But then not to just think that it's about going and finding only like-minded people and staying with them, but to move out and move on. I hope in some way it answers. Any others? Doesn't have to be a question, could be a contribution. There, good. Let's be great, come on. <laughs> now, I love what you said about um, there not being business anymore, just social enterprise. Um, how do you see that transition happening? Is it in businesses seeing themselves as social enterprises? They just didn't realize it? Or, you know, how, how will it become like a, a known thing that you don't say social enterprise anymore, you just call it how we do business? Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. Um, what I do know is a huge issue within many organizations at the moment is the uh, young people coming into those businesses who demand to know where they stand on sustainability, where they are in terms of their values and ethics and all the rest of it. And that's having a big impact and that will shift it. Ultimately, I think there have to be changes to the law, you know, because we, we have a legal definition for companies at the moment that obliges them to, to give shareholder value the uh, first priority. And yet there has been, in the last year, there was a slight shift in that, in the phrasing of that responsibility and obligation, which allowed a slightly bigger stakeholder group to exist. Well, that tells me that if that's possible, it is possible, eventually, to begin to change that obligation, so that in the end, let's say, we had an obligation which says that the first duty of the directors of any organisation would be to the health welfare and etc etc of their consumers and the environment and all other things of that type that that be the first now what would it take to get there it'll take some earthquakes and you know in the end of course the reason these organizations exist is because we, we somebody keeps buying their products so the moment that we begin to spend differently will have a tremendous impact and that's one of the things business is so good at is that when it really senses that change it can spin on the sixpence it can make it, it has some of the world's best people at making things happen but how we spend our money is hugely important and how do we do that well it's we're, we're having impact at the moment but nothing like enough but it's it's certainly tempting now, I remember, in fact it was um, about 10 years ago, I was invited to join a team that were looking at Unilever's global purpose. And I arrived at that meeting and there was, there, there was a really kind of de dejected and depressed feeling in that meeting. And I, when I walked in there, I said, why, why is everybody so down? You know, it's quite an interesting topic. Isn't it? What is Unilever's global purpose? And someone looked up from their paper and said, because stuffing money in shareholders' pockets is Unilever's global purpose. And, you know, much as we understand it, it doesn't feel particularly inspiring. This is a whole group of Unilever people. So we're in that meeting, we formulated, we said, what if Unilever, with all its huge resources, experience, etc., etc., chose to describe its purpose in terms of what it could really, the benefits it could bring to the world, and the means to getting there, and I completely say this doesn't change the business model, but the means to getting there is its profitable um, growth and all the rest of it. How would that be? And they were so excited at the idea that their business could be a power for good. People want this, I think. So that 
was taken from that meeting and it was sent up to the executive. It was mash up, massaged, chopped around a bit, a little bit taken off, taken out of that meeting, passed to another meeting, they massaged it, chopped a bit more off, folded it, it went from this to this and it became Unilever's Vitality Mission. But now there are all sorts of exciting things happening in that business. It's a very long road. And, and of course we all know we don't have maybe a very long time. All I do know is if we can find a way to light this firestorm of change, and that to me is this, this question, how do we bring a people to their feet? A people, not just isolated individuals. If we can find our way to that, then business will, will change. Oh, one last thing before I do, I mean, just looking at Barclays Bank now, Anthony, can't remember his surname, the new chief exec now that Bob Diamond's gone, is a really good man. Actually, he's quite a startling, extraordinary man. We need more people like that coming. Where, now, how successful will he be with Barclays? I have no idea. But I do know, actually, that they have deliberately appointed someone there who has very strong uh, commitment uh, and so we need more people in those places. But actually, we can't leave it up to the chief execs. Chief execs without then all the rest of it, they, in the end, they're powerless. Every leader's real challenge is looking behind his shoulder, wondering if anybody's following. So, yes. Again, it's difficult to form a question, but um, I heard you talk a few years ago and I came very briefly to Anglican um, and, you know, uh, uh, what you've created there, your, the phrase of a garden to grow people. And, um, yeah, I found that extremely powerful. Um, and I, yeah... Uh, what I'm curious about, or what I'm, I'd love to see more of, is that nurturing of the activists and that Native American eldership that you've received, that teaching and that guidance. Um, I'm just kind of thinking about the, the, the group of people who are um, sort of trying to, you know, I want us to be as effective as activists as possible and I'd like to see much more gardens <laughs> to grow people. Yeah. Um, and I, do you see that happening or, um, yeah, I don't know. I'd love to see a, str a strategy for us to actually support what's needed to sort yeah. of develop, grow the people. <laughs> and me too. But you know, uh, of the organizations we deal with, and you've, you've heard some of the names, they're a hardcore uh, multinational of one, one, one group. We also, uh, some of the big NGOs, uh, environmental and other NGOs. And I have to say that they are infinitely more difficult to deal with than any of the big corporations. They do not get that their people need sustaining. They don't. We have worked so hard to try to get friends of the earth to send, you know, to connect with them and say, we could help you. We love what you do. But some of your people and many of your people are burning up. Why don't you let us into your organization? We could just speak, even just to talk in a way that would soften and gentle and let them know that they've been seen. And, and let them be recognized and let them be heard. Because in, in another big environmental NGO, when I went to them and I, and I, I got in there to, to speak, I spent the morning talking with people in that organisation. At the end, I came back and I started my talk. I said, here you are, with all your intelligence and all your experience, with all your dedication and your passion, with all your most beautiful thing that you wish to bring to our world because you care. You, gather, you mount a campaign, you pull all the resources together, you use everything that you've been given, you mount this campaign, it's sophisticated, it has everything that in it 
You mount the campaign, you win a few little battles, you ultimately you lose, you fall back. You gather your resources, you re-strategize, you redefine your objectives, you launch the campaign, you win a few little battles, ultimately you lose, you fall back. You gather your resources, you redefine your objectives, you etc. etc. You mount your campaign, you win a few little battles, ultimately you lose. This is reality for all our big environmental NGOs and not just the environment environment ones some, but this is it. Can you imagine what it's like? Maybe some of you can, maybe some of you are in there. It is entirely understandable that such people's hearts get to a point where they just don't know how much more they can take. And they overwork themselves. They overwork themselves, they're entirely not sustainable. So my big plea would be to Greenpeace, to Friends of the Earth, to all the others, get over the embarrassment of this sort of, the, the, about soft issues. Understand that your people need to, 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 there is something which is deeply needed that will help nourish those activists so that they find a way to be sustainable so they can go through never-ending series of defeats and remain undaunted and filled with joy still. Because many that we get arrive at Emcom on the journey and they are filled with, not, they're not filled with joy, they're filled with anger. And they're filled with grief. They're filled with pain. It is not right. And we should allow that to happen. We should be doing everything we can to, to assist them. Now around the country and around the world, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, Embercombe does not, does not aspire towards lots of little Embercombes everywhere, but there are just lots of places like Embercombe, just a piece of land, a piece of land where people can come together and where, where the objectives have been clearly defined and whatever is delicate has been protected, is what we've tried to do, so that nobody can come and just buy the land and do whatever. And, and, but yes, absolutely, fires that we can gather around, share stories, find a way. You know, that's why I mentioned the spiritual thing, you see, because I do feel myself. We need something around which we can locate our activism that will sustain and, and, and is not so shakily built on a set of beliefs or even on hope. That question of hope comes up a lot. But if, if hope for us means hope that one day we're going to open, a, uh, open up a key on into the internet and uh, see what's happening in the world or read a newspaper and, and the headlines is, guess what, the glaciers have stopped melting. It's all going to be okay. You know, if, I, if our hope is that human nature is, is just suddenly going to change, it feels to me with the activists we have coming and many of those who care deeply at Emcom is a different story and what we say is rather than being focused and this is a delicate thing but instead of being entirely focused on there must be a happy ending to this story what if we just take our focus away from that and we just say to have been born on this garden planet, at this time in history, with an education and healthy enough and intelligent enough and everything else to make a difference, I am, I am so filled with gratitude for that. And I step forward and whatever the end story is, I have no idea, but at least I will give myself that privilege at the end of the life of being able to say I feel proud of who I am and what I've done. Feels to me wonderful, wonderful wonderful thing so we need to create more of those places we need also a story the age of stupid and other films like that i think are amazing and wonderful and co contribute but in the end i think we need a different film which is called the world of our longing what is the beautiful world that we wish to be part of? Let, what is the, in, in other words, what to imagine? We need to be in not just imagining the catastrophe. We need to be imagining that wonderful and extraordinary world we need to be part of because it tends that what we imagine, I think, comes about. So let us imagine more people like the, the guy who gave me all that money to buy Embercoon. Let's imagine more of our really wealthy people saying, what could I do? And they suddenly hook to this idea 
of buying little 50 acre plots around the place or a five acre plots or even you know half an acre inside our cities and different places where people can come and that can happen and there are some and they are happening and I'm sure more will come so we'll see but meantime I hope Greenpeace Friends of the Earth every single other one my goodness they're like in the stone ages in terms of people development and caring for people and they are meant to care. It's bullshit at the moment. So, let's hope, let's imagine more Max, more Embercombs. Thank you so much, Max. Thank you. <laughs>